Okay, for our next speaker. It's actually amazing that I'm here today. Uh, not here as in on the welcome conference stage, although that's pretty amazing too. But here as a dining room guy at a fine dining restaurant. Because about 12 years ago, I got very, very close to leaving fine dining. I grew up in the restaurant business. Service is my passion. I love service, just like a lot of the people on this stage and a lot of you do. But I found myself in a situation where this thing that I had spent my entire life pursuing and being passionate about was something that I was running around my restaurant, trying not to get yelled at by my chef, and trying to convince him that it mattered. And that just started to get old. And then I met Daniel Hoom. And in him, I found two things. First, and granted, I may be biased, but the guy that I think is the best chef in the world. And second, someone who not only believed in service, believed actually that it was just as important as the food we were serving, but from day one trusted me and trusted that I was going to do right by him in the dining room and supported me. And suddenly, fine dining service became fun again. Because when you know that the guy in the back has your back no matter what you do, you're going to reach further, you're going to try harder, and some things that otherwise never would have come to fruition suddenly start happening left and right. We were just in London for the 50 best, and he was awarded uh, the Chef's Choice Award. And it's this award that, all right, yeah, give it up. <laughs> but he's very, very important to me, and so I get really proud of him. And that moment, I like, was very emotionally proud of him, because it's an award that chefs from all over the world just talk about something they would believe in and they support. And I think it's because he's a great chef. But I think even more than that, it's because he's a warm, gracious, lovely man. And so uh, I'm excited that he's the first chef to speak at the Welcome Conference. And I'm really excited to introduce my chef, my business partner, and my best friend, Daniel Hume. Thank you. Well, thank you, Will. Um, really excited to be here. Uh, I want to start by telling you a story. Um, it was New Year's Eve at 11 Madison Park. You guys all know New Year's is such a big night in New York, and it's a huge night at our restaurant. We charge a lot of money. People make reservations way in advance. And we take it very seriously. We, stand up, we spend a lot of time planning the menu. Of course, we're using all the luxurious ingredients. But we also always try to introduce new dishes for just that night. It's a really special night. That day, I was in the kitchen all day prepping with the team, spending time uh, with the cooks to make sure we're going to have a smooth dinner. For me, days like this are really exciting because there's such a high intensity and everyone is really, really focused. We were pushing hard that day to be ready on time. But as the night unfolded, it turned out to be a really, really smooth and harmonious service. The kitchen and the dining room were working so well together and everything was working like clockwork. It was so much fun to be in the kitchen that day. After we sent out the dessert, at this point it was past midnight, it was probably 1 a.m., I started making my way out into the dining room. It was a magical night. It was snowing outside. We had giant wreaths with all uh, these little lights decorating our windows. Through the window, you could see the snow falling. And inside the dining room, it felt like we were in our own little bubble. 
It made me so happy to see that what has started as a sit-down dinner now has turned into a party. People were up from their tables. People were talking with each other. People were drinking champagne. People were dancing to the live music we had. The energy in the restaurant was unbelievable. I found Will, and um, we decided to have a glass of champagne at the bar to give thanks for the wonderful year that has passed and to look forward to the year that was ahead. But as we started talking about all the things we're thankful for, something happened. I look across the bar and I see a bartender sh pouring shots of whiskey to some of our guests. Already that took me by surprise because people at our restaurants don't drink shots. <laughs> but then as I keep looking, the bartender is taking a shot with the guests. I couldn't help it, but it made me angry. In my head, it's like, what the fuck is he doing? He's drinking. <laughs> he's, he's on his job. He's on the clock. <laughs> but then I look over to Will, and Will is looking at the exact same situation, and he was still smiling. <laughs> but you know what? Just seeing that, I stopped being angry. Because here is the thing. Will is in charge of the dining room, not me. So if he's not angry, I don't need to be angry. But why? First, it's because I trust Will. And trust is the most important part of our relationship. Truly, trust is the foundation of our entire company. He runs the dining room, and he is really good at it. And I trust that he knows what's right. But it's also about something else I've learned over the last 10 years working together. It takes different people to do different jobs. The person who is a great candidate for a chef, we want them to be focused, organized, head down, work very clean and neatly. The person we want in the dining room, we want them to be outgoing, open, smiling, charming. Two very different people. If you look at a soccer team, for example, if you look at the positions of a striker and a goalie, it takes very different skills to play, play these two positions. If the goalie would act like a striker, or the striker would act like a goalie, I guarantee you that team would never win. And it was the same thing that night on New Year's Eve. That night would have not been a great party if the bartender would have acted like a cook and just stared down onto his drinks <laughs> and making sure every garnish was just placed perfectly. That night would have not been fun. EMP is not a chef-driven restaurant. EMP is not a dining room-driven restaurant. Will and I, were 50-50 partners. We make all the decisions together. We run the restaurant from both sides. I'm here to tell you why I think that this is the right way to run a world-class restaurant. Back in the day, restaurants were a whole lot different than they are now. Restaurants were driven by the maitre d'. For example, the Waldorf cookbook. The Waldorf cookbook was written by the maitre d'. <laughs> <laughs> People didn't go to restaurants for the food. People went to restaurants to see and to be seen. Going to a restaurant was a social event. The chef was nothing more than an employee in the background. And the food really, it really wasn't good. But how can you expect it to be good if the person behind it isn't recognized? But restaurants are a lot like art, music, 
or fashion. There is a cyclical nature to them. And eventually, the pendulum shifted. Let's say it started with Paul Bocuse, probably the first celebrity chef. Then came the Food Network, chefs like Wolfgang Puck, Emeril, chef conferences all around the world, Mistura, Matt, Mess America. Now, it's a chef-driven industry. To be clear, it's an amazing time to be in food. It's an unbelievable time to be a chef. There has been so much progress. The community of chefs is unbelievable. The information that is available to us is vast. The access to ingredients and all the sharing that's going on all around the world. It's unbelievable. As a young chef, it's cool because you can build your own restaurant without spending millions of dollars. You can put your food onto vintage plates. You can use reclaimed tables and chairs. You can even be your own contractor when you built that place. If you have the talent and the skill as the chef, you can make a name for yourself, and the whole world will talk about you. And that is awesome. <laughs> it's amazing for all the people on the receiving ends, all of our guests. This focus on food has trickled down to all levels of restaurants. You can have great meals in humble places. You can have amazing and creative food for pretty cheap. I've had some of the most amazing meals in some of the most unexpected places. But I'm noticing a trend. More often, it comes at the expense of great service. No tablecloths, no silver cutlery, no French porcelain, no sommeliers running all over the place, no big wine lists, no expensive flower arrangements. That's fine. You don't need all that. But no service and no hospitality? It's gone too far. You see, food is an art. I've lived it for the past 25 years. I'm still learning. I'm traveling for food. I collect cookbooks. I read all the food magazines that are out there. All I do is think about food. I think about the seasons, what flavors go together, and how to make every dish as delicious as it can be. Food is my entire life. But you know what? Service is an art as well. And it takes a lifetime to perfect it. It takes people who dedicate their entire life to that craft. The technical elements, like pouring a glass of wine, carving a duck table site, even as simple as clearing a table. The emotional elements, how to give a gracious welcome, how to genuinely connect with a guest and make them feel loved. That doesn't just happen overnight. The way I look at a dining experience is like one big recipe. All the steps are ingredients. The food, the service, the wine, the welcome. They all play a huge role. Every element is crucial. You can't just leave off ingredients. If something is missing, the recipe will fail. So this is my message to all the chefs in here, but to all the chefs worldwide. We need to realize that we need to create incentive for people to pursue a life in service. Because otherwise, why would anyone want to go down this path if the end goal is to be in a position where every day they have to convince their chef that what they care about so much, it actually matters. 
If chefs around the world don't do something, ours will be the generation that great service dies. But what is it that we need to do? And it starts with ego. I'm a chef. You guys know, we all have egos. <laughs> we need to recognize that it's not all about us. It's not easy. It took me all my life to get to this point. And now I have to share the spotlight with Will. <laughs> But to tell you the truth, and I always said that, I would rather receive half of the attention if it means that the restaurant can be twice as good. But it's also comforting to know that when we're in the kitchen, working our asses off, making sure everything is perfect, every dish is delicious, someone out there in the dining room is working just as hard to make sure that the guests are comfortable and, then they, and that they leave happy. Of course, it's nice to have a partner when we succeed to celebrate with, but when we fail, which also happens, not to be alone. Believe it or not, but it's been a bumpy road at EMP. For sure, we have received a lot of praise but there has been some harsh criticism along the way. I'm not sure if I would have had the strength and conviction to stay the course if I would have been alone. So restaurants were over here. It was all about the dining room. Now restaurants are over here, and it's all about the chef. And all I'm saying is that restaurants need to be somewhere in the middle. It's about balance. It's about the food and it's about the hospitality. We need to break down this wall. If you can remember three things from this talk today, I know that we as an industry are taking a huge step forward. Number one, understand that different people are meant to do different jobs. Number two, learn to check your ego at the door. And number three, have faith in the people around you. Trust them, because above all, restaurants are about relationships, and relationships are about trust. Thank you very much.